welcome to our regular podcast, Knowledge Empowers. As always with you is me, Kate Anya Haseyo. And then we have Baruch. Hello, hello, hello. And we have Kovac. Dobrano, dobrano, dobrano. Good morning, everyone. And we have a guest as far as from Britain. And his name is Paul. Paul, hello. Hey, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And good morning, everyone. Paul, could you please introduce yourself as whatever you want? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Paul Skinner. Um, I'm the author of a couple of books. Uh, most recently, The Purpose Upgrade, Change Your Business to Save the World, uh, Change the World to Save Your Business. Um, and before that, I wrote a book uh, called Collaborative Advantage. Um, I run a, a non-profit community called Marketing Kind, where we think the world's problems can also be read as marketing briefs in disguise. Um, and I do advisory work with organizational leaders on selecting, defining, and mobilizing around purpose. My book is called The Purpose Upgrade. Uh, change your business to save the world. Change the world to save your business. Um, it's also available on Audible and elsewhere as an audio book. So for anyone who prefers to listen, that is accessible as well. Um, the key premise of the purpose upgrade is that far from being a fixed object like profit maximizing or a North Star, our purpose can be our most adaptive capacity as humans. Um, it can be our most renewable resource in enterprise. And a purpose upgrade can be an always available event for any organization of any size in any sector. Um, and the subtitle construction, change your business to save the world, change the world to save your business, um, is becoming increasingly literal in today's disaster prone world, where actually we are all creating through our businesses ripple effects that reach much further than we can see um, and that rooting our activities in being part of the solution rather than generating further problems um, is key to a success that we can enjoy, a success that will endure and a success that we can be proud of. So who should read your book? Who should be interested in what you are describing in The Purpose Upgrade? So I think anybody with an interest in organizational life and how we can elevate the success, um, vision and impact of any organizations, not, not just businesses even, but, but charities, um, governments, NGOs as well. So anyone with an interest in improving um, how enterprise um, operates in the world, um, for its own benefit and for the benefit of, of that world. Um, I would say I'm, I have a, a very strong interest in narratives and how we form our narratives of purpose. Um, somebody I was speaking to recently to start describe themselves as a corporate psychiatrist. Um, and I think there is a, a dimension of the book that could, could be quite helpful to anyone who is interested in cultivating their own purpose, their own purposefulness, um, that of their teams and their, and their organizations. So hopefully everyone will be able to find something in it that they can connect to intimately, um, as well as organizationally. So, Paul, actually, I have a first question and we have actually a list of questions and this is not from that list. <laughs> so, um, actually, what made you write a book about purpose? Yeah, so um, I, I would say I, I as you um, for anyone watching the video, as you can see from what's behind me, um, I consider myself a, a reader first and a, a, and a writer very much second. I've written two books, but have you know, certainly read more than two books. So I tend to only um, write a book if an idea really takes hold of me and I feel that ultimately there's almost no alternative but to write it. Um, and often you know, my work involves me in challenging the, the dominant narrative in a particular field. So, you know, my first book I wrote to challenge the conventional goal of competitive advantage because I felt that it was causing us to miss out on a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, with regards to, to purpose, similarly, I felt that the dominant narratives, whether it's maximizing shareholder value or even um, sort of more enlightened approaches where people talk about purpose as our North Star, um, tended to think about purpose in very fixed 
static ways. You know, the North Star uh, is always in the same place, whereas in the human world, our problems are changing all around us. Um, and it felt to me that we needed to, you know, that didn't really explain how we become our most purposeful. You know, we're often at our most purposeful when something goes very badly wrong, for example, and we have to completely reprioritize. I mean, the, um, President Zelensky was in, in the UK a couple of days ago, um, and I remember a speech he gave um, quite a few months ago saying, Ukraine didn't seek greatness, but Ukraine has become great. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to develop a way of thinking about purpose as a, a more adaptive capacity for humans, a more renewable resource for enterprise, um, and that upgrading our purpose might be not something that you can't do, <laughs> but something that is in fact an, an always available event. So you mentioned your nonprofit organization and uh, uh, also the purpose of it to uh, help with the marketing part of here. How did you come up with this purpose? How did you define yeah. that? So um, I guess you can think of marketing as a department in an organization alongside HR and finance and so on. But you can also see marketing as a narrative-based discipline alongside other narrative-based disciplines, whether it's psychology, therapy, fiction, politics, art, culture. Um, and so my interest is really in the, the narratives that shape who we become individually in organizations and, and across society. And so in a sense, with Marketing Kind, we've created a community where we can come together to, to elevate those stories and to, to change them for the better. You know, I really do believe that if you look at the world's biggest, most pressing problems, whether it's globally or locally, um, they typically depend for their resolution even more fundamentally than on technology, even more fundamentally than on finance, on forms of human cooperation. And so, you know, Marketing Kind is a place for us to come together and to look at the stories that will elevate those forms of human cooperation. Um, so we have, you know, three three things. And so, so that means it's for people, by the way, change makers and a much broader group than people who happen to have marketing in the job title of their, of their day job. Um, and uh, so we come together, <clears throat> our members get to uh, every month, uh, upcycle our marketing skills in support of a different pioneering charity or social enterprise and build a, a portfolio of social and environmental impacts. Um, we get to coach and support each other in becoming more conscious and impactful leaders in the day jobs and to, to bring in more systems, uh, systemic uh, uh, considerations into our day jobs. Um, and we also get to to work with many of our heroes in exploring some of the, the the bigger narratives that we live and work by and how we might change those for the better. Um, and of course, I've learned a lot of what I've put in in my most recent book, in, in, in any case, from many of the people that we've worked with at Marketing Kind, whether it's marketing leaders like Seth Godin, whether it's um, leading economists like Rebecca Henderson, um, or environmentalists like, like Mike Berners-Lee. Is there a purpose which was particularly interesting for you or inspiring for you, which is like not of your own, because that one is probably the most inspiring, I guess, but some someone, the you've mentioned IKEA, Greta Thunberg, individuals and companies. So which was the like? Yeah. Which so I think one of the things I'm really interested in the purpose upgrade, because in a sense that I, my sense is this, you know, science cannot tell us if there is a meaning of life. At least it cannot do that yet. Um, but we can't help but live lives of meaning because meaning is what we use to map the world around us and plan our journeys to better. Now, the world is always moving and changing, and so those journeys have to keep shifting. And so I think what's fascinating to me um, is not to identify an individual purpose as if it was absolute and, you know, that is the, the ideal purpose to pursue, but rather to recognize that a lot of um, today's problems were actually previously solutions. So we're not necessarily malign or ill-intentioned in the first place. Um, and secondly, um, that, you know, today's solutions 
will inevitably end up becoming tomorrow's problems in some way, shape or form. So we always have to be vigilant to, to change our, our purpose and to upgrade it. So, for example, maximizing shareholder value, um, I would say, is deeply problematic today. Um, but that doesn't mean there wasn't some common sense in the idea when it was introduced. You know, businesses were becoming more globalized, investors were becoming more removed from leadership teams, and some way of aligning their interests seemed self-evidently um, useful. As the context changed, uh, and too many people pursue the same purpose of efficiency, which creates fragilities on a global scale, of course, that's led to a lot of problems. And so, you know, fewer people would speak and um, with an ambiguous praise of for, for maximizing shareholder value. Should I give one example of how this has worked in in, in practice? So one uh, business where I worked with several generations of the top leadership team on the book um, is a was a, a business that was formerly a coal mining business that managed to become a sustainable food business. Um, so that, that business is, is called DSM, that, which originally stood for Dutch State Mines. Now, that company was born from digging coal out of the ground and delivering it directly to people's homes for heating and illumination. Now, today, their business goals include things like um, reducing the micronutrient deficiency gap for 800 million people, um, achieving double-digit um, re on-farm reductions of um, climate emissions, improving the livelihood of 500 million smallholder farmers. It almost sounds like contradiction to what we're doing. Well, the, the contradiction to the business they were doing before, like when it, when it comes yeah. to mines and coal mining and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, what, what I would say is that in making that transition from, from coal mining, which was actually a perfectly respectable endeavor, uh, but which, of course, today is, of course, complete, pr completely problematic. You know, I would say DSM is quite a, a metaphor for the kinds of purpose upgrade that, that we need right across society, because we know that, you know, today, living and working as usual it has become deeply destructive. Um, and so I think we need to, to remember that a lot of the, the problems were yesterday's solutions, so we can bring some understanding to them, um, but also that a lot of the, what, what we're doing today could be unconsciously creating you know, quite, quite deep systemic problems for tomorrow, and so we, we therefore need to adapt and elevate our purpose to integrate that understanding. Yeah, like with the plastic, everybody wanted to have everything in plastic because it will endure for hundreds of years and now you're like oh god what have you done <laughs> with the plastic yeah do, do you know um we had an it, we ran an event at marketing kind recently with john elkington who developed the triple bottom line concept and people planet profit um and uh i i don't know if i'll recall this with sufficient accuracy but in his latest book he he mentioned a, an inventor called thomas midgley um, which just so wonderfully uh, illustrates this point. Midgley was responsible for inventing unleaded petrol. No, leaded petrol. Sorry. Now, of course, that invention was useful because it enabled a breakthrough in efficiency, um, making transport more inclusive, accessible, and so on. But of course, it then turned out that it had a, a, an extremely deleterious effect on our nervous system. He also invented chlorofluorocarbons. Mm -hmm. Now, again, it was a breakthrough because it made aerosols much safer to use. But then, of course, it ended up causing the, the hole in the ozone. And somewhat um, in a sort of dark irony, he um, had a debilitating illness and he invented a mechanical bed that would help him get out of bed in the morning. Um, and apparently it inadvertently ended up strangling him. Um, <laughs> oh. uh, we, can, we can understand that it, it is often, I, I think we need to recognize both that intentions can be very good, so something that's wrong today, it wasn't necessarily malign in its intentionality. But secondly, that, you know, we can all be caught out by the th the unintended consequences of, uh, of our prior purpose. And that's why I think that, you know, we need to think of purpose not as a North Star that will be eternally perfect, um, but, but rather as something that we need to 
renew with vigilance, particularly in such a surprising world as the as the world that we're now living in? So um, this would be very suitable kind of attitude for businesses today. How about how about personal attitude to purpose? Would you suggest that we should keep changing our purpose? So I, I think there is no element of purpose that has to be set in stone. Um, so there was a comedian, Groucho Marx, who had the wonderful line, those are my principles. And if you don't like them, I have others. Um, <laughs> and and uh, we tend to laugh at the idea that uh, purpose can be variable and so on. But actually, you know, I, I might, um, you know, ask you, you know, do you have the same values today as when you were a teenager? Um, and do you think that it's possible that when you look back in many, many, many decades time at your life as a whole, that your values will have further evolved? Mm -hmm. um, so, Just for those who are listening to us, all three of us, we're shaking heads like, nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my was phone was like, let's, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> it was to the first question rather than to the second question. <laughs> <laughs> Should people read some other books about purpose from maybe different authors hmm. to understand what you're talking about in your book? So I think absolutely that you, you remind me of one of my favorite French writers, André Gide. Um, and uh, in one of his books, he, he addresses you as the fictional reader of his book. Mm -hmm. You're called Nathaniel in this particular instance, but it, it's quite fun to become a character in the book by virtue of reading it. Um, but in, in one of his, I think in, in one of the, the books where he adopts that strategy, he says, I want you to become, uh, I want you to read my book. I want you to become interested in my book, but I want you to become interested in yourself more than in my book. And then I want you to become interested in others more than in yourself. Um, and I think that's a, a, a really powerful lesson. Um, and in terms of reading, um, purpose, <laughs> We often think, as well as thinking that purpose is our North Star, we often think that purpose comes from within and is about authenticity. Um, and I would say that actually purpose is best born not from introspection alone, but as a product of the relationship between us and others in context. I mean, for a business, there's no point in offering an authentic experience of gastronomic delight in an environment of food poverty you know, for example. And so, you know, purpose is really born. It's a coping mechanism for addressing our problems. And that's how we get into purpose in terms of its evolutionary origins. You know, we're living beings um, in a universe where, you know, we haven't yet learned to live forever. So we have a, a finite life and we hold on to life and make the most of it. And so much of what we do is part of you know, biology struggle um, through evolution to resist the challenge posed by the entropy of physics. Um, so we're really thriving is about doing our best as well as we can for as long as we uh, can. And so I would say to, to really thrive, we want to root our purpose in meaningful problem solving. Um, and so I would advocate for reading everything that helps us understand the world around us, that helps us understand the most valuable problems that we can lean into, to understand the most valuable challenges that, that we can undertake. The good news is that today's world gives us plenty of um, problems to get to get stuck into. And so I think that's that's the kind of reading people should prioritize if they're looking to become more purposeful. Do you do some kind of like a seminars, like after, for example, if people read your book and obviously they might have questions. So whom is the best to ask, if not the author, do you do 
like a seminar is up like afterwards that people can then join and then have a place to ask further questions yeah if anyone would like me to talk with a group um in their company for example we could do a, a sort of a a deep dive into a purpose upgrade in an hour so we can do a very concentrated session um on the book um or i can spend a a day with an organization um and of course in you know, my advisory work um although it becomes you know more flexible and isn't sort of located just within an individual concept most of my advisory work is is helping leaders um elevate the purpose um impact and success of the organizations or particular initiatives within them that they lead for the listeners uh, we will keep polls like contact uh, in the comments and now to the second question and i need to bring it here if you were a regular employee in a corporate and you finished this book what would your next steps be <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, a purpose upgrade is best achieved when you look at the organization as a whole. And so it needs both leadership in terms of direction setting, but it also needs a purposeful culture because although you need leadership to take concerted action, um, ultimately peripheral vision, fostering relationships, identifying the creativity that will come to renew that purpose has to come in a distributed way. So I think this is for everyone. Um, you know, even, you know, let's say you work on reception in an office building. Um, we can upgrade the purpose of that. Um, you might currently think that you're there so that people, when they arrive at the building, you know for security reasons who they are and who they're seeing and that you direct them to the right place for their meeting. Okay, but what if the purpose was actually to improve the caliber on average, even by a little bit of every meeting that took place for that company with people from outside of the business? You know, what if you stay in touch with the latest gossip so that when you know who someone's meeting, you can share some inside information that will make them smile? What if you have a little budget for some baked goods so that if somebody isn't looking quite at their best when they arrive, you can give them a little bit of a boost? Um, what if you're a train manager and you check tickets on a train and you think that you're there to make sure all the passengers have the right tickets? Well, that's great for the train company but actually what if instead your purpose was to make a small contribution to improving the journeys of people on the train mm -hmm. making sure the internet is working making sure people have access to what they need to know um or just occasionally you know maybe saying something that will stick with somebody um throughout their day um so you know, sorry to jump in your words but this morning we had a breakfast date with my husband Mm. And we went to a place uh, and there was this lady, she had this huge smile on her face and she asked us, have you already tried our QR ordering? And we were like, not yet, would you like to? And, and then give me feedback because we're trying to improve and you can mm. do this and that. And then she gave us also like hand, hand out, but she was so pleasant, like so nice. and. My husband a little bit sensitive to that as he's a huge introvert and he was like, oh, I just have such a nice day. And and she just kept smiling all the time and then she uh, listened to our feedback and so on. So it was really just that small gesture just really made our day just beautiful. And it yeah. was amazing. It, it's interesting because often, you know, the I'm often writing to kind of unpick and replace particular narratives, often narratives that have originated with finance and economics. And what's interesting is that economics assumes so much away. You know, once you reduce something to a number, you take away human context, human relationships and human nature. And so a lot of it is not very behaviorally adapted and you end up with a sort of computer says no mindset in instances. So one really nice example of a management practice that unpicked a lot of that and helped us just be more ourselves at work in a way that automatically fulfilled this goal um, was a, a tourist destination called the Eden Project, which when it opened, the very um, charismatic founder um, said to all his staff, you know, if you 
come up against a problem with a customer um, that we haven't anticipated. And there isn't somebody immediately available to tell you what to do. If you just use your common sense and respond to that problem and try to address it meaningfully and you get it wrong, I will fully support you. But if you just ignore that problem and keep going as usual, you're not the right person to work here. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I just felt that maximizing our ability to use our full capacity in context is is one of the best ways to to make our purpose more adaptable and adapted. And giving people the trust that you have towards them. Mm, lovely. <laughs> Hannah Arendt, the philosopher, said that ultimately the final advantage of democracy over dictatorship is the capacity for renewal. You know, the mm -hmm. fact that you have that ability to say, nah, no, we think this is wrong mm -hmm. and we want to change it. Um, and I, I think that that can apply um, in some ways. There isn't a more valuable way to increase the value of an individual job, an individual activity, or an individual business, and then by elevating its sense of what success looks like in the first place. Um, and so pursuing the right version of success rather than sticking blindly to a, a prior version that is no longer right for circumstances is, is, is very key to this. We were talking about the corporate just now, and I wanted to have a look from the outside on a corporate or any purpose of a company. And we know that this purpose is creates fellowship. Like you're attracted to a purpose which you somehow can relate to or you can contribute to. How can I pick or what should I look into? Any guidance there? How to pick the correct purpose which I would like to contribute to or I would like to become a follower of? Um, so, so you mean for for somebody who's considering what company to work for? Yep. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So, so I think the first thing to to think is that purpose may be available almost anywhere, um, and there is nowhere where purpose can be guaranteed infinitely. Um, so, you might go and work for a carbon negative brewery and find that there are aspects of what they're doing that are deeply off-putting to you. You might work for a technology business, which ends up being incredibly purposeful because it turns out that it can be used in the context of disasters and emergencies in ways that hadn't even been envisioned when it was invented. So, so we can always be um, on the lookout in that sense. I think um, in terms of making sure that we have a, a good pathway, one thing that, that we might prioritize is seeking to work with companies and organizations that are rooted in some of the bigger problems that we know may morph, but are not going away. Um, so if you, you know, in today's world, we all need to be doing something that addresses the problem of the climate emergency, the problem of biodiversity collapse. Um, we really need to be doing something about extreme inequalities. Um, but there are, you know, many other issues. And so um, I think that looking at a, a business from the perspective of, is it solving problems that humankind is going to need to solve today, tomorrow, and further into the future. Um, and I think that that can be a, a, a very powerful way to, to know that you're rooted in something that is going to be worthwhile for a long time. Since we are on the topics of uh, companies and corporations, uh, I would like to ask if you are a huge corporation and you already have a purpose set, mm -hmm. When would be the right time to look again on that purpose and uh, evaluate if you need to redefine it? And if that time comes, if you define that you are actually at that stage where you need to redefine the purpose, how how should companies look at the purpose today? Yeah, so I think, you know, we are in a more crisis prone world. 
um, our environment is dominated increasingly by what economists call exogenous variables um, and that I would call things that take us by surprise. Um, and, and we're really not short of those these days. Um, and so in terms of reviewing purpose, I think the first thing is to, to recognize that renewing our purpose is, is something that often we assume that that can't take place. And we assume that if we're challenging the very vision of success we're working towards, are we just being disruptive and unhelpful? Are we holding our bosses back? That kind of thing. And so I think the first thing is just to introduce cognitively the notion of perp of a purpose upgrade as an always available event means that we have an extra layer of a deeper layer of um of um adapt adaptive change that we can bring to an organization um and then secondly um purpose is really born from from the problems we have to solve so in a sense th there's a line in a uh uh, a song I heard a few days ago, if you're looking for a purpose, then no purpose will you find. I think it's no bad. Um, and uh, if we look to the changing nature of the problems around us, it becomes easier, first of all, to identify purposeful activity and also to align people in, around the recognition of the need to pursue that purposeful uh, activity. Um, and in today's environment, you know, we don't know the degree to which the climate emergency will lead to more global cooperation or more conflict or the cost of living crisis will lead to more breakthroughs um, or, or just more retrenchment or what will be the impact of technologies either in terms of advancing our opportunities in life or actually making us more fragile and exposed to rather than more rather than less exposed to risk. Um, but this environment creates quite deep, rapid and extensive shifts in the priority needs of the people we're serving. And there was a, a banker who in 1929 said to the Harvard Business Review that we needed to go from a business culture that addresses needs to addressing desires. And in a sense, that maybe gave birth to consumerism, the marketing profession, and so on. I think today the pendulum is swinging back the other way. And the way to make sure that we maintain an adaptive purpose um, is to lean into the changing nature of the human needs among our stakeholders. Um, and that can help us be more vigilant, find more valuable purpose to pursue, and better align people around that purpose. We, you mentioned here, like all the theory here on HBR about the needs and desires. And you also uh, said uh, the theory of maximizing shareholders' profit, which comes from Milton Friedman, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct, which is also a theory which I'm really not a fan of. <laughs> uh, and I was wondering um, if you've met Milton Friedman, what would you say to him or ask him or let him do, you know, whatever. What would be your meeting like with him? Uh, I would cut him some surprising slack, I think. <laughs> um, and the reason for this is, so profit maximizing, if it was an experiment, first of all, there was a reason for it. So, you know, businesses were becoming more global and the problem was that business leaders were becoming far removed from business owners. And, and there wasn't, we didn't know quite what to do about that. It was called the agency problem. And so the idea of shareholder value maximization was a genius, simple, um, and powerful way to attempt to align the interests of those groups. And so if a small number of businesses tried this out as an experiment, I think we'd learn a huge amount of valuable insight from that experiment. The problem is this, it became the dominant goal of all businesses, or certainly all, business, all corporates globally. Um, and like any good idea, it has a shadow. So what about all the other stakeholders? What about externalities? What about destroying the environment? You know, turning our home into an asset to be depleted and exploited? You know, what about rising inequality? Um, what about the Im unintended impacts of technologies? Um, uh, so um, in a sense, it became you know, maximizing shareholder value as an outcome for a few businesses, fine. Um, as a goal 
for business is less good because it doesn't really tell you how to go about creating your profits in the first place or or what things to avoid if you want to continue doing that for a long time. So as an outcome, it was okay. As a goal, it was less good. But as a goal for all businesses to pursue at the same time, collectively creating enormous hidden fragilities in the economy, massive disruption and destruction of society, um, and the devastation of huge portions of our planet, you know, that, that's where it's gone wrong. So I think I would cut him some slack in terms of the initial ideation process. The, the problem is that we have taken his idea too literally and to too great a scale, and that it now needs to be completely re renewed. This will be a tough question, probably, but <clears throat> I'll brace myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if a company is interested in maximizing their profits, mm. is there any way that a good, well defined purpose can help them with this? So, um, it is the case that since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, even though it's somewhat of a travesty of his thinking. Um, in classical economic thinking, we've been told if you seek selfish benefit first, we somehow end up with a collective good as the happy byproduct. And a lot of people have been using the line recently, I can't figure out who's used it first, that maybe the invisible hand was invisible because it's not really there. Now, the, the good news is that reason and evidence suggest that if we turn that upside down and we seek to contribute to our stakeholders first, then we can end up deriving our own self-directed benefits as our share of the much greater, not wealth of nations, but wealth of change that making a business for something greater than itself can, can unlock. Um, in a sense, there's something myopic about trying to maximize shareholder value, because if you only undertake activity that you know in advance to be profitable, you actually only end up taking a tiny subset of the total available activity that could end up being being the lifeblood of your business. Um, and so I think, again, rooting our activities in solving genuine problems, um, enough of those problems will end up creating value for ourselves um, that we can um, continue to build on our successes. And, and particularly, you know, the interests of all stakeholders become more aligned the, the longer term perspective that, that we can adopt with that. Um, so I'm sure there are cost cutting, efficiency generating, fragility creating ways to rake in some extra profit in Q1 and Q2. Um, but if we actually want to succeed for the long run, um, then, you know, great, greater purpose is a, is a pathway to doing that. I've heard an opinion of one lady just about as like, if you don't like the company, for its, you know, maximizing the shareholders' profit, you can either stay and keep up with that if you can't change it, or you know, there's the door if you can, if you think that you can make it better. And I think that this is one of the ways how we can make these huge companies starve to death, basically, because without the manpower, they are not really there. And also, I think in service age organizations, professional services as well, um, they're becoming under increasing pressure from younger employees n not to take on particular clients. Um, mm. And so I, I think that, um, I think you're absolutely right. And the dilemma of whether to, you know, to, to be the change from within um, in redirecting something or whether to support the new is an eternal dilemma. And you have to look at the particularities of, of each context. Um, the, the only thing I would say is that if we think about purpose as an adaptive capacity, then it, it expands the, the context a little because we know that not not every of not all of today's problems originated in ill intent, and many of today's good intentions will ultimately end up having to be redirected because they will lead to uh, uh, unintended negative consequences. Um, so I think you know we address every every situation 
the answers are to be found in the in the particular context of that situation. The very thing that economics tries to exclude from our thinking, with the economist's eternal phrase, ceteris paribus, all things being equal. The thing is, in a human world, all things are never equal. And so we want to look at the particularities of each circumstance to see where we will make the biggest difference and where we'll achieve the most purposeful success. College, what would be the recommendation? Well, Kat, I do have a recommendation and you can wonder what sort of recommendation that is, right? <laughs> so yeah. I, do, I do recommend reading the Purpose Upgrade book uh, from uh, author Paul Skinner, you know? So I think that w when you start this podcast again, you can get the more information about what this book is about. But I really, really strongly recommend that. It's not just about the Purpose Upgrade. You can read there a lot of stories about companies and individuals and how they bring their purpose upgrade to life and also some guidance for you some questions to think some purposeful next steps for you to do your own purpose upgrade paul is are there any last words you would like to say to our listeners and to our viewers so um in in buddhism apparently there is a, a tradition i think it's called the koan um, of asking a question that is deliberately designed to disrupt a prior pattern of thinking, to open the door to a more expansive model of thinking. Um, and so maybe I'll leave with a question that I've put to a few leadership teams recently that they found an interesting provocation, which is, you know, what if instead of trying to lead the best businesses in the world in your particular sectors, you shifted to trying to create the best businesses for the world. Um, what could that mean for your stakeholders and what could it mean for your business? Well, that's very powerful. Thank you for sharing, Paul. And thank you for uh, being with us on this podcast. It has been so much fun. <laughs> with that said, I'm going to say Sugash Asmida. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao, 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 ciao. Bye. <laughs> This podcast represents our own opinions, experience and our own ideas. We do not represent any official statement from our employers and this is not their official channel representing the company.